Hey ho, tutor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tutor Time Machine, and this is episode 16 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. We've had such a great time researching it and working on it, and especially bringing it to you. At this point in our story, Constance has just finished a dangerous mission to the Tower of London. At the Arundel Inn, Philomena and Blackjack are spending some alone time. In this episode, we'll see what Princess Cecilia Vasa is up to. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 16. The Laboratory of Dr. Delanoy, in which Princess Cecilia shows her knowledge of the art of alchemy and of the art of manipulation. Cecilia's heart went out to Master Delanoy. He was sweating, and her beauty was the cause. Master Delanoy was so lively at the party at the Arundel Inn, but at her suggestion that she must know his alchemical work, that they must leap together into the night, his demeanor subdued. He hesitated. He was afraid of Queen Elizabeth. But Cecilia coaxed and beguiled, and so, of course, here they were at the doorway to his laboratory. He stumbled as she stood beside him. She would turn away, allow his ardor to ease. The long cloak that had lent her anonymity as they had slipped away from her attendants lay around her shoulders. She would pull the cloak back over her face. No, she would not. Delanoy must be strong. As he opened the door, a candle lit the laboratory. Servants sitting, curved spines on benches, half asleep. Ah, what she had heard was true. Delanoy did not have the heart to continue his work. The queen had given the first coin, but the court astronomer, Dr. John Dee, had regained the royal ear and was speaking against this alchemical rival Delanoy. Misguided Elizabeth let Delanoy fester here with no fire, and he was in despair, dejected, friendless, alone and adrift. But this night fortune smiled on the skilled alchemist. Cecilia herself would step in where England's queen had fled. She would convince Delanoy to persevere. She would be his champion, his inspiration. Her presence would trump the evil ones who held him back. Her vassar Enechia, the final ingredient of the elixir. Master de Lenoy, how I weep for you. Your fire is dead, cold. Your experiment is spoiled. Your grace, have you come to mock me? How could he doubt her sincerity? She must bolster him up. Never. I see you as a warrior. How you stand strong in the face of disappointment, smile at court, and wait for your next moment. Her words lifted his spirits. Good, she could not suffer spending time with a dejected pout. I will succeed and fulfill my bid to the queen. Oh, Pish, that fabled heel of Achilles was this man's slavish desire to please Elizabeth. And yet it might be best not to convince him out of it. Cecilia could use it to her advantage, if she was patient. How able she was to always catch the tide that would carry her to shore. I could never doubt you, Master Delanoy. You must try again to make the gold. Have courage, dear doctor. Do not give up. He waved his arm, and the servants busied themselves. Soon the fire was lit. Oh, she loved to see others bustle about. A book lay on the desk. Cecilia shivered in glorious expectation as she approached it. Prima clavis, the first step in the magnus opus. A drawing, she knew its meaning. A king for gold, a queen for silver, the wolf for grey stibnite. Master Delanoy's hand clutched a crucible. Then a bone ash cup. He spoke in a low mumble, stopping to think. He poked his lower lip out. Cecilia gloried in the transmutation the pure art kings should strive for, a Midas touch and eternal life. She could hardly restrain herself from picking up the enticingly shaped vessels which lay scattered about her. She could identify each one, the Boca Contra Bocum, the Tripudianter, the Rumina, the Aquilae, in the middle of the wall, the huge furnace now blazing. On the other side hung dead snakes, and over it a scaly animal, its massive jaws open to show rows of razor teeth. 
Your grace, Delanoy's eyes beseeched. Do you understand? Nature wishes to be perfect. Lead wishes to be gold. It is the way of all things, dear doctor. A peasant wishes to be noble. I understand. The queen brought me here and provided me this laboratory, and she will not throw it all away. No, dear man, but it is not right that you should stand idle when your talent is so great. Cecilia knew she must handle Illinois as she would a married man, who hesitated, despite his unquenchable lust. It is an injustice, dear man, that John D. blocks your way, speaking so lightly of your talents. But you must not give up. Your work is hard, dear sir, the way opaque. But that is by design. Are not the secrets of the ancients writ in mystic symbols? Are not the great mysteries of life clouded in parable? It may seem fantastic, and yet I, a simple princess of Sweden, will be the key to your success. Complete the work, dear philosopher, with me as your helpmate. Master Delanoy looked up at her, and she pressed on. Lord Cecil is under the influence of John D. Cecil will see to it no merchants sell you anything. No sulphur, no mercury, none of the instruments you will need. If only you would allow me to help you, sir. Captain Hawkins is at my command. He can obtain everything in the most careful way. Captain Hawkins knows all the merchants, and has recently returned from a voyage, his ship overflowing with goods. I can drive a fine bargain on your behalf. It was not necessary to add that money would be kept. A royal could not waste her time in deals without some cash benefit. Master Delanoy brightened at this offer. Your grace is most gracious. I agree. I gave you the money. You, my lady, will acquire the goods and then I will make the gold for the queen. He continued complaining that he lacked enough sulphur and mercury, and the beakers had far too much sand in the glass to be of use. Cecilia was surprised at the great Elizabeth Tudor's poor regard for this miraculous art of alchemy. The queen was no better than those merchants who asked alchemists to produce a headache remedy. Thankfully she, Cecilia, had an eye fixed to the future. How could the world continue in its sphere without her to help it along? Dear man, for my favour you must grant me something as well. You will make the lapis philosophorum to transmute metals for the English queen. But as for I, Cecilia Vasa, I desire something even greater. The elixir of immortality. With those words Cecilia took herself off, no backwards glance at the alchemist. He would accept the bargain, she was certain. Outside the laboratory, the sky was on the verge of dawn, yet she could not bear to return to Bedford House. It was too dull. Disguised by her cloak, she would roam the London streets until her excited temper had cooled. All had gone perfectly with Master Delanoy, as she expected. Our Princess Cecilia wants to live forever. In keeping with her ego. I mean, the world can't do without her. <laughs> and she is looking to something called alchemy to make it all possible. Wealthy people, that is exceedingly wealthy people, have always looked for a way to live forever. For sure. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Jeff Bezos, they've all talked about finding the secret to immortality. I read that Peter Thiel has injected himself with a young person's blood to regenerate himself. And I actually have two friends who wanted to be in a freezer together, but they got divorced. So hopefully they've arranged for separate freezers so when <laughs> they wake up in 500 years, they won't be faced with each other. People dream of living forever. They want to live forever, then is now. And Cecilia's using alchemy to try to get there. So alchemy is actually a forerunner of chemistry. It's a material science that deals with the idea that everything is made up of tiny particles and those particles can be transformed or transmuted. Transmutation is the name of the process whereby one thing becomes another. Water is boiled and turns to steam. Now we associate alchemy with wacko thinking and magicians, but in the 16th century, in this early stage, they did not assume that there were limits to what kind of transmutations were possible. And this obsession with alchemy in the Elizabethan period was actually an outgrowth 
of the Renaissance humanist education because the Renaissance looked back at classical texts and reconsidered Aristotle's ideas that everything was made of four elements. Fire, water, air, and earth. And these concepts were the groundwork for alchemical reasoning. And alchemy was practiced everywhere in the ancient world, not just in Greece. Its resurgence in Europe came about during the Renaissance because of all these wonderful new translations of Islamic and ancient Greek writings that were circulating all over Europe. Actually, if you have the chance to read books about the ideas in early science, it sounds very mystical. Mm -hmm. It's simply because they didn't have the language we have now, and we choose to use a language that makes everything sound very, very clinical. Yes, like there's a real difference between the way we speak about scientific things and the way we speak about philosophical things. But they didn't have that division. And I know, Gage, you're not a fan of calling yummy, yummy meat a protein. <laughs> no, I dislike that. And saying that that emotion, true love, is just a chemical reaction. No. Oh, it's so dry and cold. You know, alchemy wasn't all mystical. It was also methodical at the time. I mean, it was sort of scientific in a modern sense, whatever language they used. And alchemists thought they were a part of something exciting, something cutting edge. Like the creation of the internet now. Right. Alchemy was mainstream. It wasn't a dark art. You could be an alchemist and you could also be a good Christian. It was believed to be a secret biblical art and that Adam was given the secrets of alchemy by God. Mm. And Eve got pain in childbirth. <laughs> so Adam, he got the good stuff. Alchemy was not considered in opposition to the Christian religion, but it was considered the ultimate expression of the oneness of humanity, that we are all made of the same stuff. And turning one substance into another is the ultimate miracle. And purifying metal is a symbol for religious purity. One of the Psalms says, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. And those ideas of refinement, purification, that's all alchemical thinking. And it's not until the 18th century that alchemy becomes linked to witchcraft and becomes thought of as irreligious. During the Enlightenment, alchemy trends way down to be something only practiced by charlatans. Enlightenment scientists, they discredited alchemy to separate it from the new empirical science where everything is numbers and measurements and there's less of a philosophical basis. They wanted us to get away from the art of alchemy and its mystical underpinnings. Even though a lot of the ideas that they used had come from alchemical experiments. People like to distinguish themselves from what's come before. But in the 16th century, when our book takes place, alchemy is considered a pure art. And Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, and her right-hand man, Sir William Cecil, and one of her advisors, Dr. John Dee, and many other intellectuals of the time were really interested in alchemy. And they certainly never considered themselves involved with witchcraft. Cecil searched out alchemists all over Europe to find someone who could turn lead into gold as part of an actual governmental plan to fix the English economy. Which sounds incredible now, but yeah. at the time it was accepted. Yes. During the two great economic crises of Elizabeth's reign in the 1560s and in the 1580s, Cecil sought out alchemists to turn lead into gold and rescue the economy. In 1565, when our story takes place, Cecil and Elizabeth were dealing with the long-term crisis of England's devalued currency. So Henry VIII began what is now termed the Great Debasement. Not because it was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it was serious. It, it was, was big. It was, it was big. big. Yeah. As usual, Henry had overspent, and in 1542, he decides to get some cash for the crown by reducing the himself, amount himself <laughs> yes himself by reducing the amount of silver and gold in the coinage and he keeps the extra silver and gold for himself and he was able to improve his own financial situation at the expense of the kingdom so worthless currency becomes a real problem for England's economy and it was an embarrassment for the government in terms of international trade in fact when elizabeth took the throne in 1558 
Foreign merchants were refusing to take English coins at all. They would only accept solid gold instead. So Elizabeth's plan, in concert with Sir William Cecil and the early economist Thomas Grisham, was to remove the debased currency from circulation and to mint a new currency made of precious metals. And this really helped the economy, and it put England back on the map as a major international force for trade. Henry VIII is such a pop figure now. Yes, of course. And Absolutely. His wives, mm -hmm. and it's just considered such an interesting period. But he really left England a mess. Having received it from his father, Henry VII, in pretty good financial in, shape. Yes. After his death, there was the quick succession of Edward, Jane, and Mary. And that just allowed the currency problem to grow. So when Elizabeth took the throne, England was deeply in debt. Elizabeth, who is portrayed as personally vain and temperamental. And maybe she was those things. Yes, I maybe she was. But not at the expense of her people. I mean, she was also prudent, which is why she took Cecil's advice and took the long-term view of caring so much about the economy. She loved a great portrait. A great dress. A great dress. <laughs> but she did not spend on herself like Henry. Mm -hmm. Her vanity was not stronger than her prudence. There wasn't a study of economics, per se, at this time. But I think Elizabeth had a pretty good feeling for what we would call macroeconomics. And William Cecil saw the possibilities of alchemy, this new type of science, to further help the economy. Why not just make gold? And as we said, Cecil was fascinated with it. And he had been since his education at Cambridge. And we know that the fabulous Mildred Cecil had alchemical books in her extensive library, and she was a very pious woman. And Cecil saw himself as a sort of expert on alchemists. He actually sought them out. And he was known internationally as someone who would give ear to them. And he was very receptive to their ideas. So other people in other countries would recommend alchemists to him. Dr. Delanoy contacted William Cecil in 1564. And he wrote him from his home in Bruges that he could make gold for the queen through what he claimed was a tested and unique process of alchemical transmutation that he himself had discovered and he alone knew. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but if someone could really make gold, why would they offer to make it for someone else? I mean, surely they would just make themselves gold and get rich. Cecil was so intelligent, you would think he would have seen through Delanois immediately. <laughs> oh, there you go again. <laughs> Jessica is always surprised by human irrationality. <laughs> I know, I know. And you know what? You think about the stock market. I mean, why would a broker give you tips to make money? Why wouldn't they keep those tips for themselves? So, you know, we still have delusions about what people are actually giving us. William Cecil had a reputation for being so steady, wise, and pragmatic. His interest in alchemy has been glossed over by many of his biographers. And maybe that's because they're uncomfortable with this interest or that it might seem weird to people, but that is applying presentism. Which is the idea that we're bringing our own attitudes to history and judging people accordingly. Yes, we cannot apply our views of alchemy to him. Cecil considered it a world of possibility, cutting edge, and if you look at the state papers of Elizabeth's reign, it's very clear that he was seeking out these early scientists to work for him to help the state. And anyway, in this letter, Delanoy assures Cecil that he has developed this super secret method, and he asks Cecil to encourage the queen to bring him to England to pay for his materials and for a laboratory, and to pay him for his labors. And the queen agreed. So Delanoy arrived in England in 1565 and set up a laboratory at Somerset House on the very fashionable Strand. It's easy to think that Elizabeth and Cecil would have thought there was a good chance that he was a charlatan, but they did not. No, they, they assumed that he was going to do what he said. Yes. They gave him the benefit of the doubt, definitely. But John Dee, who was an astronomer and a mathematician and a very renowned map maker at court, he did not trust Professor Delanoy, and he did have Elizabeth's ear. In fact, he had famously cast the astrological forecast for her and chose the date of her ascension to the throne. And what's so interesting is that just as alchemy and chemistry are sort of two sides of one coin, astronomy and astrology are two sides of one coin. 
because one is the study of the horoscope, astrology, and astronomy is the study of the stars, but they were equally legitimate at that time. Absolutely, yes. Astrology was another practice at the time that was considered an art associated with math and science. Again, being interested in it seems at first glance to be opposed to the practical level-headed idea we have of Elizabeth, but she would not have seen it that way. John Dee was not an ethereal wizard sitting up in a tower with a tall hat on. He was brilliant in math, a renowned tutor, a translator of Euclid, and an expert in the incredibly practical skill of navigation. He was ambitious and aggressive. As a statesman, he advised Elizabeth to pursue colonization of the New World. He trained her navigators, and he advocated for this idea of a British empire. For better or worse. For better or worse. (laughs) And he was also an alchemist. Right, so he didn't object to Dillinois because he didn't believe in alchemy. No. He just thought Dillinois was not a good alchemist. That's important to say. The question is, did he doubt him out of rivalry as a fellow alchemist getting in with Elizabeth, or was he genuinely suspicious of his ability we, we just don't know, but he did speak against Delanoy to Elizabeth. And he also spoke to Cecil against Elizabeth. And so Professor Delanoy begins complaining to Cecil that all these bad vibes from John Dee and the lack of quality materials given him are making it impossible for him to make what is called the Philosopher's Stone. So the Philosopher's Stone is not only in Harry Potter. It is the elixir of elixirs that all 16th century alchemists strove to create. And weirdly, this stone is not a solid object, but a liquid. And if any listeners out there know the origin of terming it a stone, we'd love to hear from you on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. But this philosopher's stone was considered necessary for the transmutation of metals and for the other great goal of alchemy, to create the elixir of eternal life. And that is what our Princess Cecilia is after in the story. We know that from the state papers in 1565 that Cecilia and Delanois were in constant communication, and this infuriated Elizabeth, who feared that Cecilia was making a deal with Delanois to have him make gold for her and not for the queen herself. This caused a tremendous amount of friction between these two royals. It was kind of a diplomatic nightmare at the time. It got to the point where Delanois was banned from having any communication with Cecilia or any of her entourage. But did that stop Cecilia? Absolutely not. (laughs) And we know from the state papers that she did meet with Delanois. Yes, there were no secrets from Cecil or from the Queen in London in this time period. (laughs) And Delanois continued in his quest to try to turn lead into gold. And alchemists continued to try. Or I guess they would be just chemists. Chemists, yeah. And in the 20th century, they kind of succeeded. Yes, according to Scientific American, and I quote, it is indeed possible all you need is a particle accelerator. Which we all have in our kitchen cupboards. <laughs> a vast supply of energy. I don't have that. And an extremely low <laughs> expectation of how much gold you will end up with. So it's possible, but not at all practical in the way Cecil hoped. <laughs> and then is now, alchemy has given way to chemistry, and we still search for ways to be rich and live forever. And maybe someday we will live forever. But in this quest for eternal life in 1565, Princess Cecilia will do some, shall we say, extraordinary things. And we're looking forward to sharing them with you in future episodes. Extraordinary things that she actually did historically, and we love that. Yes. Bringing history, fact, and story all together. And making it fun for you. So listen in next time when we return to Bedford House and find out what happens when Constance delivers the Earl of Rutland's ring to the lady of his dreams. Thomason St. John. Yes, join us for our next podcast and leave a comment on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page and please consider becoming a Podbean patron. On the Podbean page you can see the perks of supporting us. All our gratitude for listening. And remember, then is now. Bye.